This is Game AI Uncovered. My name is Paul Roberts, and in this video, we're going to be looking at Jump Point Search, with a link to the original paper in the description below. To kick things off, we're going to be looking at the concept of symmetry. This is something that afflicts many a pathfinding algorithm, but something that Jump Point Search looks to address. Now you see this red path, it consists of four diagonal moves and two horizontal moves. The blue path, although taking a different route, also consists of four diagonal moves and two horizontal moves. This means they will have the exact same cost. The same goes for the green path and the purple. In fact, if we remove all the colours, you can see that stepping along any of these routes will result in a path consisting of four diagonal moves and two horizontal moves. This is symmetry. And if we can search for a path from the start node to the target node without having to search all these symmetrical routes, it will speed things up. More on this later. Let's take a look at the jump point search algorithm. But what's on the screen right now is the A star algorithm. That's because jump point search is an optimization to this. We begin by adding the start node to the open list. We then begin the search loop by finding the cheapest costing node on the open list. Right now, this will be the start node. We then check to see if this is the target node. If it is, we can simply stop searching and exit the loop. We have our path. If it's not the target node, we then add each of the current node's neighbors to the open list. This is a simplification. In the yellow shaded box, we would also check if the neighbor is already on a list and calculate its costs, but I don't want to get bogged down in that here. And then we move the current node from the open list to the close list. If we backtrack a little and go back to that shaded box, this is where jump point search modifies the A star algorithm. Instead of simply adding neighbors to the open list, jump point search does the following. It gets the successors of the current node. This is a whole new process which will be explained shortly. We then check if we have an unexplored successor. If not, we can return to the previous flow and continue with the A star algorithm. But if we do, we then jump in that direction. Again, this is a new process which will be covered shortly. If jumping failed to locate a jump point, we loop back around and look to see if there is another unexplored successor. If we did locate a jump point, then we add this to the open list, stop searching in the current direction, and look to see if we have another successor to explore. This continues until we run out of successes, at which point we return to the A star algorithm flow. The difference here is that the open list now consists of jump points. Right, let's take a look at how we get those successes. This is the first step on the jump point search flow that was inserted into the A star algorithm, and the approach used depends on the movement direction. We know we are using the horizontal approach if the vector from the parent node P to the current node N is a horizontal move. When looking for a successor node, it will always cost us more to go back on ourselves, so we can discount this as an option. The same is true for moving diagonally backwards. We can get there cheaper by going directly from the parent node. How about above and below? Yep, it's cheaper to go through the parent node. Remember symmetry? This is how jump point search stops the searching of symmetrical routes. How about diagonally ahead, above and below? Well, these costs the same as other routes through the parent node, so we were going to assume they are searched via this alternate route and ignore them. The only option remaining is a successor next to the current node in the direction we are moving. There is no cheaper route than going through N, so we will keep this. But things get interesting when we have obstacles. The cells highlighted in red can no longer be reached by the parent node, so we need to handle them. These are what are called force neighbors. So in this example, N would have three valid successors to explore. Let's take a look at moving vertically next. Well, this is very similar to searching for successors horizontally. We can ignore all the neighboring cells apart from the one directly ahead in the movement direction for the same reasons just discussed. This leaves us with a single successor to explore. Again, things get more interesting when we have obstacles. The highlighted red cells have to go through N, so these are force neighbors. In this scenario, N has three successors to explore. Diagonal successor searches are a little different. Again, we don't want to go back on ourselves or go down routes that are cheaper via the parent node, 
so all of these can be ignored. In this example, the cells above and to the right can be reached for the same cost via an alternate route, but we ignored these when searching horizontally and vertically, so we have to handle them now. This leaves us three successes. And again, obstacles make things interesting. In this contrived example, we would normally ignore the highlighted cells, but they can't be reached from P any longer. So they become false neighbors that we need to explore. Remember, a false neighbor is a cell that can only be reached by the current node. This gives us five successes to explore. Now we have our successor list, we need to jump in those directions. And we can determine the direction to jump in by calculating the vector from the parent of the current successor. And there are three directions, horizontal, vertical, and diagonal. Let's start with horizontal again. We know we can ignore the greyed out cells for the same reasons discussed earlier. So we can jump to the next cell in the desired direction and then repeat the process. This continues until we find a jump point or we run out of road. In this example, we hit the edge of the map so we can stop jumping. Again, obstacles make things interesting. So following the same process discussed when searching for successes, we come across a false neighbor. The highlighted cell cannot be reached via the parent node so that makes n a jump point. In other words, node n needs to be explored further. At this point, we stop jumping and return n, or jp as it's currently labeled. Moving vertically works just like horizontally did. It's just in a different direction. One point to note though, if you run into an obstacle, the response is just the same as running out of the environment. It returns no jump point. When passing an obstacle though, we find ourselves a false neighbor, which makes n a jump point. So we return n. Diagonal movement is different. We have three directions to explore. First we move vertically, then we move horizontally. And if neither of these return a jump point, then we move diagonally. If one of them does, we don't move diagonally. We know how to move both vertically and horizontally, so we can skip these for now. But what is important to note is that if the original movement from P was upright, we search up and right. The same rules apply for the other three diagonal directions. Right obstacles. If our jump movement finds a false neighbor, then we return the current diagonal node as a jump point. We've covered a lot, but let's bring all this together and step through an actual search example. So the start node gets added to the open list. As it has no parent node, it will search in all directions for successes. Jumping vertically up finds no jump point, so that direction can be ignored. Jumping diagonally up gives us a child node labeled A. From A we need to search up, which results in no jump points, and horizontally right, which also results in no jump points. So we can jump diagonally again. This gives us node B. From B, we search vertically up, and again there are no jump points. But searching horizontally right, we find ourselves with a false neighbor next to node C. At this point, we add node B to the open list and stop searching in this direction. S still has unexplored successes, so we continue to jump in the direction of those. To speed things up, it is clear that all these directions result in a collision or the edge of the grid so we will quickly get past these. S is then moved to the close list and the cheapest node on the open list is selected for expansion. This is node B. The direction from node B from its parent is a diagonal upright movement. So when searching for successes, we have three options. Vertically up runs out of the grid. Diagonally upright ultimately returns no jump points horizontally right finds as a false neighbor. This time C is the expanding node that is not on the open list. So we add C to the open list and stop our search. B has no more successes to explore so it gets moved to the close list. C is then the cheapest node on the open list so we continue from here. C is moving horizontally from its parent node B which gives us two successes to explore the one to the right, and of course the force neighbor. Moving diagonally down right 
as that is the direction of the force neighbour from C, we find node H, which results in node jump points when searching down and right. So we jump diagonally again. Node I does find a force neighbour though, so we add I to the open list and stop the search. C has no further successes to expand, so it gets moved to the close list. I is then the cheapest node on the open list, with three successes. Moving horizontally right from here finds a force neighbour at node J. J isn't on the open list, so we add it and stop searching in this direction. The other successes don't result in anything interesting, so I gets moved to the close list. J is then the cheapest node on the open list. It has a horizontal move from its parent I, which gives it two successes to explore. Don't forget it has a force neighbour. From node AL we find the target node. This itself is a force neighbour, so we stop the search in that direction and add AL to the open list. The horizontal successor from J hits the edge of the grid, meaning J has no more successes to explore, so it gets moved to the close list. Next up is AL. AL has three successes because it has an up right diagonal movement from its parent J. When moving up, AL finds the target node, which is a jump point, so we stop searching this direction and add T to the open list. All other successes fail to find a jump point, so AL gets moved to the close list. T is then the cheapest node on the open list, but as this is the target node, we can stop searching. We have our path. So to wrap things up, this is the flow again that was inserted into the A-star algorithm. Remember, I've not covered it here, but you need to calculate costs, assign parents, and check if nodes are on lists, just as you do in the A-star algorithm. This has been Game AI Uncovered. Thanks for watching. Before I sign off, if you have an interest in Game AI, check out these books. Artificial Intelligence and Games will get you up and running with step-by-step -step code guides, and the Game AI Uncovered series is filled with insight from professionals about how they did the AI for the games that you love.